It's Adam in the morning. Enjoy it, love it. Playing all the good music from classic to old school. I tell all my friends to listen to it. Rusty Mike Radio. The last few days have been a uh, very tense time, difficult time for Israel, and I have to say for other countries as well. Uh, the United States, as the Palestinian Authority, have gone to the United Nations. Let's just hear a little excerpt from President Obama speaking to the UN, and then we're going to speak to Shmuel Rosner in just one moment. We believe that each nation must chart its own course to fulfill the aspirations of its people. And America does not expect to agree with every party or person who expresses themselves politically. But we will always stand up for the universal rights that were embraced by this assembly. One year ago, I stood at this podium and I called for an independent Palestine. I believed then and I believe now that the Palestinian people deserve a state of their own. But what I also said is that a genuine peace can only be realized between the Israelis and the Palestinians themselves. One year later, despite extensive efforts by America and others, the parties have not bridged their differences. And I am convinced that there is no shortcut to the end of a conflict that has endured for decades. President Barack Obama speaking at the United Nations, a speech that did get quite a lot of praise. However, I think my uh, perhaps my next guest might have a few thoughts on what all this means. Shmuel Rosner is an editor and columnist uh, based here in Israel. He's, he writes in the Jerusalem Post. He is a contributor to the online magazine Slate for Mariv and used to be the United States correspondent for several years of Haaretz. And it's great to welcome Shmuel back to Rusty Mike Radio. Shmuel, are you there? Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank course. you for sparing the time. It is appreciated because... Uh, we need some clarity here. It is so difficult. I, I said to you off air that I, I, I love politics and I read stories and try to use critical analysis to come to some understanding. Uh, I am so confused by whether this is what Abbas, where Abbas wants to be, whether he's got himself into a position he can't get out of, uh, whether this is good for Israel or disaster for Israel, and where this leaves Obama and what Obama was saying, uh, whether he's changed his tune. Um, I would love to know your thoughts. Well, I, I think the bottom line is that this was this was not good for anyone. The, this whole uh, this whole uh, um, um, week, this whole going to the UN process by the Palestinians uh, was not go, good either for Israel uh, nor for them, uh, nor for the Americans, uh, uh, and it leaves us. Um, Exactly where we left a couple of months ago. Now, you, you started by, by letting us hear some of the comments made by President Obama at the UN. This was one of the strongest, um, most convincing speeches ever given by President Obama on behalf of Israel's well-being and security. It was a very impressive speech in that, that sense. Right. But v- many people missed uh, what Obama was actually trying to do. Obama didn't change his core views uh, regarding the uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process. He didn't refute any of the comments or the statements he had said back in, uh, in uh, May when he made the comments about the 1967 line. Mm. So I don't think his beliefs had changed. What changed is that Obama uh, felt the need to tell the, mostly the Palestinians, but also the international community, that he would not tolerate and he would not cooperate with any attempt to achieve uh, uh, the goals of the Palestinians without going through negotiations. And these negotiations would have to be uh, with the involvement of the United States of America. Obama did not like this this uh, move by the Palestinians for many reasons. But one of them was that this was a, an attempt to push aside the American med- mediator to tell him that he is no longer acceptable to the Palestinians, that he can no longer serve as acceptable mediator to both sides, mm. and, and choosing a different venue, namely the UN. Now, this is something that no American president would tolerate, and President Obama in this sense is no different than any of his uh, 
uh, predecessors. But they need, yeah. surely the, 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 the Palestinians need the support of America, whatever they do, whatever happens, both Israel and the Palestinians need America's help in achieving, even after negotiations, whatever ends are met. Right, and, and this was the point Obama was trying to, to drive and to, uh, and to emphasize in his speech. He was, he was rebuffed by uh, the Palestinian leadership. Well, have you heard? He asked, them, he asked them time and again not to go to the UN, not to go to the Security Council, and they uh, um, essentially told him, right. you know, it's none of your business, we are going to do it. We are sick and tired of uh, American leadership on this issue. We no longer believe that you can provide us well, uh, with any solution, so we are choosing a different venue. And Obama, standing at the UN, was telling the Palestinians and the members of the UN, if you are serious about the peace process, if you want to leave any chance for any future breakthrough, you cannot uh, you cannot go uh, without taking us our position into account and our mediation into account. Shmuel, can I just play you something? Very, very, a five-second clip. This is Abbas speaking this morning. There will be no negotiations without international legitimacy and a complete halt to settlements. It sounds like he's sticking to his position completely. Yes. Abbas is, uh, is in a strange place right now. He, he went to the UN. It was, not, um, it was not a failure, but it was not the success that he uh, was hoping to achieve. The United States was very firm in its position. And essentially, uh, uh, some members of the European Union and what we call the International Quartet uh, were not quite happy with the Palestinian move, were not quite happy with Palestinians' insistence on the exact path uh, that, they, that they chose to, uh, to uh, pursue. So eventually Abbas came back home as somewhat a hero, because he was standing up to the world, he was, he was um, uh, standing on his principles, but on the other hand, on the actual goal of achieving any diplomatic, uh, um, any diplomatic goal, he, he didn't achieve much. He, what he got from the international quartet now is basically a demand to go back to negotiations, which he rejected for the last year. Right. For the last year, Abbas was saying, I will only go back to negotiations if Israel freezes settlement activities. Now, what the international quartet, again, this is not just the United States, it's the United States, the UN, the European Union, and Russia. They're all telling him, you need to go back to negotiations with no preconditions. Now, if Abbas refuses to go back to negotiations, the international community will have no choice but to lay the blame on the Palestinian side. And that's one of the reasons for which Israel was quite, um, quite quick to say that even though it is not uh, uh, entirely satisfied with the uh, uh, statement of the international quartet, it will accept its demand to go back to negotiations, to direct negotiations, and it it, it even said that it will accept the, uh, the timeline, the timetable that the quartet was trying to set, which to all people even vaguely familiar with the peace process is obviously uh, not a very realistic timetable. Did you say that? Uh, and, I, and I heard the quartet state, but meanwhile you've got people like the British Foreign Minister saying that it's in Israel's hands, stop building, and, and it's all about the settlements. And I wonder if over the next few weeks the narrative will once again change back to settlements rather than uh, Palestinian re re recalcitrance to, to, to negotiate. Well, the, the, this, this is the game we were playing for the last year. The Palestinians were saying it's all about you not wanting to free settlements, and the Israelis were saying it's all about you not wanting to go back to negotiations. Now, the competition over the uh, narrative uh, in the next weeks and months will be exactly the same. 
However, Israel did achieve something in the sense that clearly the United States is now on Israel's side on this issue, and at least the official statement coming out of the quartet, of course, different members of the quartet can later say, well, we think that Israel should also free settlements uh, uh, for this or that reason. But the official statement coming out of the quartet did not mention specifically any need for settlement freeze as precondition for going back to direct negotiations. Right. I mean, negoti- it, it, my feeling is that we've said a lot on here that the Palestinian people haven't been prepared for what negotiations mean by their leadership, which means they're incapable of going to those negotiations because negotiations will mean very painful compromises by both sides. Nobody is going to get what they want. And the Palestinians are demanding that they get what they want before the negotiations start, some of the biggest issues. And I think that's because they just haven't prepared their people for this idea that what negotiations will mean is a Jewish state side by side with a Palestinian state on some of the land that Palestinians have said they won't negotiate about. And uh, we, we're also going to make, I think, very painful compromises. Well, we, on, 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 this, on this issue, you hear different stories and different narratives from Israelis, Palestinians, Americans. Each has its own story. Palestinians are saying that they're not going back into negotiations because they, they weren't convinced that the Netanyahu government is, is at all serious about trying to achieve uh, lasting peace and that they, would not, they do not want to waste ten more years on, on fruitless negotiations. And, and since they no longer believe in Israel's uh, uh, good intentions and in American uh, abilities to, to mediate or to pressure Israel, that's why they chose the path uh, they, they've, they've just pursued uh, of going through the, U, the UN. Uh, what Israelis are saying, of course, is that Palestinians do not want to go back into negotiations is because they are not um, they are not prepared to make the necessary sacrifices uh, of any uh, feasible compromise. Uh, we have to remember that Palestinian leadership only controls the West Bank and the right. whole question of Gaza and what what to do with with the Hamas government that controls Gaza is a very difficult one for the Palestinian uh, leadership. Uh, it's not clear what Palestinians want to do now. Uh, some observers believe that the Palestinians are now going to go into a period of uh, uh, preparing for maybe uh, new elections, maybe a um, uh, change of guard, uh, Abbas. Many people believe that uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, uh, is not going to uh, remain as the leader of the Palestinian Authority. So they might now go into a transition period in which uh, any uh, Palestinian leadership might not want to uh, uh, conduct any serious negotiations right. with Israel. I mean, Arkat and other people contending for that position aren't going to want to be seen to be doing... I mean, they're going to be slammed by Hamas right. if they start negotiations. I, I see all of this, and I just... I, I, uh, in a way, it, you, you could almost despair because... Uh, BB is a right, you know, it is a right of centre government, but it's a, it, it, this is a government that's lasted, and uh, there's a possibility that this government, which seems to be left and right, um, might be the one to negotiate with. Yeah, and, and, and speaking about politics, one, one has to take in, into account the fact that if the Palestinians are now going into a political transition period, and remembering that we have American elections coming in November 2012, and possibly, probably, uh, Israeli elections uh, just a little bit before, before November 2012, or, or maybe a little bit after November 2012, then we are now going into a year or a year and a half that for any of these three governments it will be very difficult to have any serious negotiations they will all be consumed by the uh, needs of, of, the, of politics and of election cycles. And I don't think we should expect any meaningful breakthrough 
in the in the coming months. I hadn't considered that. Of course, it's it's going to be an almost sunny election cycle here. Uh, we know it is in America, and uh, Israel's featuring strongly. I was actually going to ask you about that. There was a um, there was a, a special election to the House, uh, the House representatives, just yeah, before. New York nine. And, and they think that the, a lot of the um, uh, pundits believe that the Jewish reaction to Obama uh, was part of the reason why the Democrats lost that seat. I don't know if, that, if that's true, but uh, I certainly read that in several articles in, in New York newspapers. Well, it, it is true when it comes to, to this specific district, to New York 9. It is, it is definitely true that some of the voters over there uh, changed their vote because of Obama's policies. Uh, regarding Israel. On the other hand, one has to remember two things. One, New York 9 is not the typical Jewish district in the United States. It's, it's much more conservative. It, it's, it, it is more conservative both religiously and politically. So I would not draw any broad conclusions from what happened in New York 9 to the broader American Jewish community. The other thing, and, and we, we don't yet know what might be the impact of uh, Obama's very firm position in the UN and his very uh, um, uh, strong speech on Israel on uh, uh, Jewish tendencies and political affiliations going into uh, election year. Clearly, Obama made a very strong speech uh, on behalf of Israel's security at the UN. Some people believe he made it not just for the sake of Israel's security, but also because of political reasons. But uh, we are yet to see the impact this speech will have on Jewish, uh, American Jewish public opinion in the coming weeks and months. Shmuel, it's been a really fascinating uh, conversation. I, I love having you on. And... Um I've, I, I think you've given me the clearest picture I've had in, in the last couple of weeks of all this. And I hope the listeners feel the same. We're going to podcast this today. Um, I, all, all that's left for me to say is I wish you a Shana Tova. And I hope you're wrong and it's a very, very productive year of peace talks. But uh, Yes, I, I hope so too. And I wish you Shana Tova and all the, your listeners as well. Thank you, Shmuel. And uh, you have a good one. Take care. We'll, we will get you back on soon, I hope. Okay, Shana Tova. Thank you. This is Rusty Mike Radio. Online now. www.rustymikeradio.com